I'll go ahead and start with the introduction. Um, today, I wanted to welcome Dr. David Robertson from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and thank you for driving down here and visiting with us. That's really great. It's obviously not very far away. It's just a two-hour drive, so it's very easy to attend both directions. So Dr. Robertson is a professor in the chemistry department at the University of Missouri, and he's also the executive director of the University of Missouri Research Reactor. Is that called MUR? Is that how you it? Okay, MUR. M-U-R-R. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree in chemistry at the University of Missouri, Columbia, and he got a PhD in nuclear chemistry at the University of Maryland in College Park. From there, he went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories in uh, Berkeley, California, and after that, he was hired as assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. He then uh, was promoted to associate professor and then full professor there at the University of Kentucky. Uh, after that, he uh, transferred to the University of Missouri as a professor in 2000, where he's been since that time. Um, he's the program director of the analytical chemistry group at MUR from 2000 to 2009, and he's also the associate director research education of MUR from 2002 to present, although now he's the executive director of MUR. So as the executive director, he has the overall responsibility for the research reactor safety and operation as well as leader, leading the research and education mission of MUR, and also to generate income through uh, products and services that are uh, centered there. Uh, his research has focused on the development of isotopes for a variety of applications, including cancer therapy, nuclear batteries, and nuclear forensics. Over the last decade, MUR has been developing processes and infrastructure to provide multiple radioisotopes for the use in diagnosing and treating disease. These isotopes include the key, key ingredients used for thyroid cancer therapy, uh, pain and uh, metastatic uh, bone cancer, and a treatment for inoperable liver cancer, as well as treatment for neuroendocrine tumors of the midgut. Dr. Robertson has published over 230 research articles and has served as an expert witness in radiochemistry. Among his honors and awards, he's been a fellow of the American Chemical Society. He's the University of Missouri 2006 William H. Byler Distinguished Professor. He's an outstanding teaching award for tenured faculty in 1999 at the University of Kentucky. And he's also been the director of the American Chemical Society National Nuclear Chemistry Summer School from 2012 to 2019 and he's the chair of the Division of Nuclear Chemistry and Technology at the American Chem Chem uh, Chemical Society in 2006. Uh, in 2006, he was named the University of Missouri Byler Distinguished Professor, and he's also a fellow, as I mentioned, of the American Chemical Society since 2010. Uh, the title of his talk today is Isotopes for Targeted Radiotherapy from the University of Missouri Research Reactor. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to come. So. And I won't get a reverb. You should not. Should not. Okay. So uh, thank, thank all of you who have joined online. And uh, I guess I should begin with a disclaimer. So um, please, if I uh, get any of the medical terms incorrect, or if I'm not clear, uh, I'm a nuclear chemist, and we very much enjoy collaborating and working with um, the physicians, but uh, there might be a good chance that uh, I, I get it wrong, and, and please don't hesitate to correct me. So uh, just a little background to begin with about the University of Missouri Research Reactor. MER is a 10 megawatt reactor. That's a measure of the power that the reactor uh, runs at. But our real claim to fame, in addition to being the largest reactor at any university in the United States, is we're the only reactor in the world that operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And when you're making medical isotopes that have half-lives of two days to seven days, this is very important. If MER doesn't run this week, Patients around the United States, Europe, the rest of the world, don't get the treatments they need next week. We are the sole provider in the Western Hemisphere 
of the radioisotopes used in Therosphere, which is yttrium-90. Therosphere is used to treat inoperable liver cancer. For lutetium-177 in Lutathera, which we'll talk about a little bit later. For the first ever approved nuclear medicine isotope, iodine-131. And finally, um, we do make molybdenum-99 for the molybdenum technetium generators, although while we're the only place in the U.S. that makes it, we only provide a small fraction of the MOLLE-99 technetium-99 used in the U.S. Um, many of the things I'm going to tell you about today, uh, really the credit goes to a fantastic staff at MER. We have 220 employees, and each and every one of them are important for making sure that we reliably deliver these active pharmaceutical ingredients every week. I, I don't want you to leave with the idea that the only thing the Research Reactor Center does is uh, uh, production of medical isotopes. Very quickly, we, we have many applications in the life sciences, including trace element epidemiology, using the reactor as an analytical tool. Uh, we also use isotopes to study in plants, the same biochemical processes you want to study in humans. In the social sciences, again, we use the reactor as an analytical tool to tease out uh, trade routes among ancient peoples or to understand how ancient peoples started with a uh, material and modified it for their use. And finally, in the material sciences, we use the reactor, again, the neutrons as a tool to characterize materials, to understand uh, the magnetic behavior of materials, and finally, we use the reactor to change the property of materials um, so that uh, they, they uh, uh, operate, for example, in high power diodes for uh, applications uh, like uh, hybrid automobiles. But we're going to stick with medical technology development at the University of Missouri Research Reactor. And so because we, we have this unique resource, and our collaboration over the last 50 years with physicians at the University of Missouri, with faculty in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and with uh, faculty in chemistry and biochemistry at the University of Missouri, um, we have helped bring uh, four FDA-approved radiopharmaceuticals to market. The first was Ceratec, which is a technetium-99M brain imaging agent that was developed by Dr. David Troutner and Dr. Wynne Volkert, and it's, it's still on the market today. Um, we worked with Dow Chemical to bring Quadramet to market, which is a, a phosphonate ligand that you put samarium-153 in, and because of all the phosphorus on that ligand, when it's injected into the bloodstream, it uh, uh, accumulates in rapidly turning over bone, and it's used as a uh, pain palliator for metastatic bone cancer. Um, the company that distributes Quadramet, Lanthius, stopped distributing it in November of this year. There are other therapies now on the market, like Zofigo, but um, uh, there are, I know that there are two or three um, pharmaceutical companies that are looking at bringing Quadramet back to the market. So, uh, uh, Therosphere, again, these are glass microspheres, uh, roughly 20 microns in diameter. They were developed by a faculty member at the University of Missouri of Science and Technology. And, uh, uh, peanut butter is under recall for Salmonella. Oh, that's okay. Probably won't You're be. tough. You can make it. Probably won't be an issue, but I didn't know that. Hey, folks, if I okay. could have you mute. Talk to Suzanne, maybe we can do stuff for you. How the, okay, how's that? Okay, that's fine. It happens in all of the calls I have with Washington, D.C. So, <laughs> so Therosphere, these glass microspheres were uh, invented by Delbert Day at our sister campus, uh, uh, Science and Technology in Rolla, and, uh, and then working with the reactor and the vet school. Again, these are uh, an interventional radiology procedure uh, radioembolism to treat inoperable liver cancer. And at the moment, Boston Scientific, who now uh, distributes that, uh, is in clinical trials uh, to see if it can be approved for first-line treatment as opposed to uh, inoperable cancer. And the last is Lutathera, which I'm going to tell you about uh, next. 
And uh, our role in bringing Lutathera to the market was uh, the University of Missouri Research Reactor provided over 90% of the uh, uh, lutetium used in the phase three clinical trials, the Netter trials. And um, uh, we today are the sole uh, supplier of lutetium-177 for Lutathera uh, in the US. I'm gonna skip this. This is a top-down view of the reactor. We put things in there. There are lots of neutrons. By putting them in there, we make them radioactive, we take them out, we do chemistry on them, and we distribute them. So, very quickly, um, we are the sole domestic supplier in the United States, actually in the Western Hemisphere, of iodine-131. You might find this interesting because iodine-131 was approved by the FDA for treating thyroid cancer in 1951, but in the... Um, uh, early 2000s, we learned that the reactor in Canada that supplies this isotope to the Western Hemisphere was going to stop doing it. So we went to the campus administration and asked them for a loan to set up the facilities that you see right here. These are the hot cells that are required to process the irradiated material to make, uh, to get the iodine-131 out. Uh, so uh, today, uh, again, we supply it to the U.S., um, we think it's a, a real success story even today. Um, it it, it uh, is used to treat differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, my slide used to say the most common, the most rapidly increasing cancer in the U.S., but I checked this week before I came, and it was, it's no longer the most rapidly increasing cancer in the U.S., uh, so, but it is the most common cancer in women aged 20 to 34, but the really good news is uh, treatment with iodine-131, uh, the five-year survival rate is uh, uh, greater than 98%. So um, we're, we're very proud that we supply this for the nation. Now I'm going to give you a couple of examples of things that I think are really changing the field of nuclear medicine, uh, which is targeted radiotherapy. And the idea is that you're using some type of, of target for a receptor, and that that uh, moiety drags uh, a radioisotope along with it. So you'll hear people talk about it as uh, radioligand therapy, uh, targeted radiotherapy. And again, you're trying to target a specific receptor uh, on, on, the, on the cancer, uh, on the tumor that, uh, that you're after. Now, the, this drug, Lutathera, Lutetium Dota Octreotate, so it's a small peptide, that uh, you bind the uh, ligand dota to, and then that uh, holds the lutetium-177, which has a 6.6-day half-life and emits a, a moderate energy beta. Uh, this is a treatment for somatostatin receptor-positive gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And um, I welcome your feedback. I'm showing you the data directly from the Novartis website, which is a 79% reduction in uh, disease progression uh, following uh, four treatments uh, with uh, Lutathera, which is sort of the uh, standard treatment. And the progression-free survival in the Netter trial was defined as the time from randomization to documented disease progression and death from any cause. But, um, I, I think that's pretty remarkable, right? 79% uh, reduction. Um, with the success of that drug, uh, which Novartis public knowledge, they paid $4 billion for when they bought that company uh, advanced accelerator applications for that drug. Novartis then went on to develop Pluvicto, which is a radioligand therapy for... Um, uh, PSMA-positive metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Um, in the trial that was just completed last year, the VISION trial, um, you had to have been previously treated both with antigen receptor pathway inhibition and taxane-based chemotherapy to be part of the trial. So, you know, this is fairly late in the disease. Um, so the results aren't nearly as spectacular as I showed you on the previous slide. But the median overall survival with the radioligand therapy uh, moved from 11.3 months to 15.3 months. 
and the median uh, radiographic progression-free survival, which is the other alternate endpoint, went from 3.4 months to 8.7 months. In March of this year, the FDA approved Pluvicto. It's now on the market, and um, uh, Novartis has two clinical trials ongoing at the moment uh, to see if, if uh, it's effective if we move the radioligand therapy earlier in the treatment of metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So I, I think um, I have high hopes for that. Uh, and again, uh, how is this changing the field of nuclear medicine? Well, Novartis invested $2 billion in this drug when they bought it from Indocyte, and then they ran the phase three clinical trial. And so the rest of industry is seeing this, and uh, there's actually a, a very large push now in big pharma and in nuclear medicine uh, to bring out new radioligand therapies, many of which will be based on lutetium-177 and iodine-131, which, remember, the University of Missouri is the only place in the United States that makes those. So it's a windfall for the university, and the um, resources generated from providing those are going back into the research programs at the University of Missouri-Columbia. So uh, I'm now going to switch gears and just tell you briefly about some work in my lab. Uh, again, the idea is to develop a targeted radiotherapy uh, using layered nanoparticles. I noticed your blue ribbon first place poster winner, right, you know, was liposomes. You said to, so, um, so something similar, yeah. right, to the phage work that uh, is described on your blue winner poster out there. So I, I want to give credit. Uh, this was work in my lab. Uh, Mark McLaughlin is the graduate student uh, who, who worked on this project. He's brilliant. He went off to medical school. He's now an interventional radiologist. So. Yeah, if I could ask all the participants, all the people watching, if they could mute, please. Um, OK. Uh, Sad Merzida is now retired from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, but uh, he, he helped us get the uh, radioisotope that I'm going to tell you about. And Steve Kennel was the individual who told me what I needed to do when it comes to the biology and, and the cancer model that we first tried uh, this uh, product with. So the iodine-131 and the lutetium-177, those are beta emitters. And I've shown you, I hope, evidence that they're effective. Um, and they're routinely used in the clinics. But uh, the, we would like to think about using alpha emitters for doing radiation therapy. Why? Well, an alpha emitter, uh, when it, it's in nature, an alpha particle comes out at about four to five million electron volts. Most beta particles that we use are emitted in an inner energy range of 0.5 million electron volts or less. Uh, the alpha emitter, because of the way it interacts with matter, it creates DNA double strand breaks as it passes through the cell. So it's much more cytotoxic than beta emitters. Uh, and I, I can give much less radioactivity to achieve uh, similar cell killing. The other nice thing is because the, we're not relying on um, uh, the beta emitter, the alpha emitters are not impacted either by cell cycle life or oxygenation, whereas the beta emitters, because their effect happens through creating reactive chemical species in the milieu of the cell, they are impacted by cell cycle and oxygenation. The alpha emitters, they have a range of about 10 cell diameters compared to the beta emitters, which is about 100 cell diameters. And so they would be ideal for treating uh, micromets or small disseminated tumors. And finally, when it comes to the important people who are providing these treatments in the clinic, nature is kind to us in that the alpha emitters usually have a very low gamma ray component. And so it's better for the nuclear medicine technicians and the nuclear medicine physicians, um, and, and they can be given as an outpatient. So just a, a quick graphic. So the beta emitters, right, their, their cytotoxicity is based upon the betas creating, reacting with the water in the cell, creating reactive chemical species, and those going on and damaging the DNA. The alpha emitters, 
they're depositing so much energy in such a short range that they are actually breaking the DNA strand through that Coulomb energy uh, exchange as they travel through the cell. So, uh, radium-223 uh, is already approved by the FDA. The drug is called Zofigo. It's radium chloride, and it's used to treat uh, metastatic bone cancer in men who've uh, had prostate cancer. Uh, it works because radium is a calcium mimic, and so when I inject that into your blood, it accumulates in, the again, the rapid turnover site, and then the radium is locked into that site, and as it decays, it gives off four alpha particles. Very toxic. Um, if you want to look up how Zofigo is working, it's uh, distributed by Bayer, and um, uh, their website will tell you all about it. Now, I would like to have something like radium to treat metastatic disease. The challenge chemically is radium is really hard to hold in a molecule. It's like calcium. And so we really don't have a ligand, a molecule yet, that will grab it. But actinium is like the lanthanides. Well, I've already given the example of lutetium, right, in lutathera, and actinium behaves like a lanthanide. So it's easy to create a ligand that holds it in place. And you see here on the slide that the actinium has a similar properties to radium. So a 10-day half-life, and then there are three radioactive daughters, so I end up with four alpha particles being emitted. The nice thing about a, something on the order of seven days for lutathera, uh, lutetium, uh, 10 days for actinium, that helps us with the supply chain. That helps us with plenty of time to synthesize the drug, right? as opposed to the typical pet agents which have a half-life of two hours, right? You have to be there. You have to be in proximity. You have to have really fast chemistry. By going to something with a longer half-life, we can do complex syntheses like making nanoparticles. Now, the challenge of using either radium or actinium as a targeted radiotherapy is retaining the daughters in the decay chain at the site, at the target site. So in the case of actinium, um, not, not such a big deal for the francium, five minutes, or the astatine, 30 milliseconds. But the bismuth has a half-life of 46 minutes. And so if we've gone through a series of decays, the bismuth is probably no longer in the targeting moiety. It's free, and it's likely to redistribute. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I also want to be honest. Uh, there's a limited isotope supply for actinium-225 in the world. Uh, the Department of Energy has already invested over $50 million in standing up a production for it. Um, and um, Terra Power, Bill Gates' company, has uh, now uh, rented uranium-233 from the federal government, and they're processing the thorium-229 from that, and they are now partnered with uh, Cardinal Health to create actinium generators from the thorium. And we anticipate that TerraPower's actinium generators will be on the market at the end of this year uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, CGMP uh, material. So industry has noticed, industries recognize the potential of using this isotope, and it's been investing. So. You know, I know this is one patient, but if you haven't seen these images, so th this is a, 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 a prostate cancer patient in Europe with a PSA level of almost 3,000 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, three treatments with uh, 0.1 millicuries of actinium-225 in a PSMA targeting agent, and the individual's PSA level dropped to 0.3 nanograms per milliliter. And then finally, they did one last treatment, uh, and the PSA level went to less than 0.1 nanogram per milliliter. So this is why industry has taken notice. This is why people are very excited about it. And I've, I've given you the paper there. Um, so uh, Journal of Nuclear Medicine, volume 57, uh, page 1941. So just that, just, just remarkable, right? Um, 
So what's the challenge of doing this other than that? Uh, that was essentially Pluvicto. That was PSA 617 with Dota, except instead of lutetium in the Dota, it was actinium. Well, that worked really well because when PSA 617 binds to um, the, the uh, receptor on the cancer cell, it's rapidly internalized. In fact, it's, it's, it happens so fast that we don't have to worry about the redistribution of the daughters, francium, uh, astatine, and bismuth. But if that's not the case, if, if the targeting agent that you want to use to, to go after the receptor on the cancer cell isn't rapidly internalized, then you have a challenge. When actinium-225 decays, the, the energy from that alpha emission imparts 100 kiloelectron volts to the daughter 221 francium. And uh, I'll remind you, your, your chemistry days, chemical bonds are on the order of electron volts. But the francium is coming out at 100,000 electron volts. So of course it's going to leave the molecule and it's going to redistribute. Okay? And when that happens, if, if you don't take care, if it's not in the cell to hold everything, then what will happen is the bismuth will re redistribute and the bismuth bioaccumulates in the kidneys. I'm told kidneys are extremely radiosensitive. A small amount of bismuth is very radiotoxic. So we would like to use the actinium, uh, and, and we'd like to have the flexibility for uh, targeting moieties that aren't rapidly internalized. And so the, this is after I, I heard about this. This is when our group started working on it. And our solution was to create a gumball, layered nanoparticles, where we put the actinium in the center of the nanoparticle. Then we add several layers. Uh, we chose gadolinium phosphate as the layers. You'll see uh, in the next couple of slides why we chose that. And then we cap that nanoparticle with gold because I'm not a smart enough chemist to know how to attach something to gadolinium phosphate, but there's lots of reports in the literature about how to attach biomolecules to gold. So that's why we chose gold. So our, our, our hope was that these layered nanoparticles would retain the radioactive daughters. I'm going to show you some data that the alphas would come out with no loss in their ability to, uh, 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 to, to, to kill the cancer cells. And then again, by using the gold, we can use lots of well-established chemistry to attach the targeting moieties. And then finally, and this I've got to give credit to Mark McLaughlin, uh, he's the one who pointed this out to me. He said, Dr. Robertson, if we use gadolinium phosphate as the layers, then at every step in the chemical synthesis, we don't have to go through chromatography. We don't have to go through an HPLC. All we have to do is put a magnet next to the test tube. And the uh, particles will go to the magnet, and you can decant everything else. And he was right. And it was genius. So uh, kudos to Mark for, for pointing that out to us. So um, for those of you, I noticed the liposome paper again um, with the blue ribbon out in the hallway. Uh, our nanoparticles, uh, before the gold, they're 22 nanometers in diameter. When we add the gold layer, they're 25 to 27 nanometers in diameter. And then we link the antibody with a dithiol peg carboxylate, uh, 800 Dalton. And when you add that linker, the hydrodynamic diameter of the nanoparticle goes up to about 100 nanometers. So, And then finally, when you put the antibody on the particle, the hydrodynamic diameter is one micron. So it's not a small particle at that point. It's a one micron particle. So, uh, yes, sir? Yeah, so how long does the nanoparticle stay in the tissue? How long? I'm, I'm going to show you some results at the end about, at least with the uh, MAB201B, how long it stayed at the targeting site. Yeah. Yep, yep, great question. Um, so first I need to convince you that, that our hypothesis worked and that we retain the actinium and the francium in the nanoparticle. And so this is retention at three weeks. Okay? And you'll notice that as the number of layers go up, the retention goes up. And as the atomic number of the layered material goes up, this is a nuclear physics phenomena, 
that uh, we retained more material because the stopping power uh, uh, increased. So we selected four layers of gadolinium phosphate, which at three weeks retained 91% of the daughter francium. Why did we only measure the daughter francium? <laughs> because the others don't really give us good gamma signals to measure, so that's what we had to do. Okay, and then we, of course, want to add a targeting moiety. In our case, uh, we used the dithiol peg carboxylate, and we activated the carboxylic acid uh, to react with the amine uh, on the antibody uh, using EDC NHS chemistry. And this uh, MAB201B, it's a model Steve Kennel has used a lot in his research. It targets thrombomodulin in the lung, not cancer, but a, a, a target in the lung. Um, so, uh, biodistribution. So the, this is, the blue is the antibody labeled nanoparticle, uh, tail vein IV injection. And you can see we approached 150% injected dose per gram in the lungs of the mice. The other place that it goes uh, are the liver and the spleen. Um, our hypothesis is that uh, the nanoparticles are cleared by the RES system, and so that's, that's why you see them accumulating there. Now, people who know about using particles um, and lungs know that, uh, you know, often it, it's, it's just uh, uh, the lungs will filter out colloids, right? So we had to prove to ourselves that this one micron hydrodynamic diameter particle wasn't acting like a colloid in the lung. And so we did a competition assay. So we gave the mice the antibody first, a large dose of the MAB201B, and then we gave them the nanoparticles, the labeled nanoparticles. And you can see that the lung accumulation clearly shows that we were able to block that. And then the green is just the bare nanoparticles. And again, they're not accumulating in the lung, right, without the target on it. Um, these, are, these are delivered by IV? IV. So I have been asked about us using inhalation. Uh, we haven't tried it yet, uh, mostly because I don't know how to do that, um, right? You, 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 you'd have to create that aerosol and, okay. So uh, people at the Laboratory for Infectious Disease Research on our campus are very interested in trying to use the nanoparticles to go after um, uh, some infectious diseases in the lungs through inhalation. We just haven't done that yet. So great minds think alike, right? Other people are telling me I should try it. So um, the other data that I show you on this slide is that the uptake uh, of, of the, the antibody-labeled nanoparticles increases uh, with the increasing number of antibodies per nanoparticle. So the lightest color is roughly one antibody per nanoparticle, and the intermediate is three antibodies per nanoparticle, and the darkest color there is four antibodies per nanoparticle. And you can see the percent ID at one hour, and then partly answering your question, but I'm gonna show you a beautiful image. You can see that, yes, it starts clearing, right? At 24 hours, it's, it's gone down, so. Now, um, let me be really careful here. I couldn't get this kind of an image with actinium-225. So what we've done is we've replaced actinium in the nanoparticle with lutetium-177, which is a good SPECT agent, okay? And so these images are our nanoparticles with MAB-201B, but they're lutetium, not actinium. And so here's, you can see just really amazing, right? It's in the lung, right, where we want it to go, and you start to see it move over time from the lung to the liver. So you can see that we, we, we lose roughly half of it after 24 hours has gone from the lung to the liver. But that's with MAB-201B. Um, so did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the next thing we tried, um, a colleague suggested that if our nanoparticles are being cleared by the RES system, the reticulo endothelial system, that we could uh, improve the uptake by first giving the mice clodronate liposomes and then injecting the nanoparticles. And so what you see here is the ID per gram in the different tissues where the mice 
uh, uh, were treated either with saline or pre-treated with the clodronate liposome. And we, we got almost a 50% increase in the lungs by using the clodronate liposomes first. So and I, I'm told that clodronate is an approved procedure in England, but it's not in the United States. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. So, um, OK. The, the million dollar question, did we keep the bismuth with the nanoparticle and out of the kidneys? Okay, And so here's the bismuth retention. We had to give these mice a lot of actinium to be able to see the bismuth, because nature's not kind in the gamma signature for that. And so you see here that the bismuth is being retained one hour and 24 hours. Actually, the bismuth retention in these tissues went up over time. We think that some of the reason for this is that some fraction of uh, the labeled nanoparticles are actually being internalized into the cells. And so we think that cell internalization is what accounts for that increase. But go look at the kidney and so you, you have to measure both the actinium in the kidney and the bismuth in the kidney, all right? So now, is there any extra bismuth in the kidney that can't be accounted for by a nanoparticle? And at one hour, that's two and three quarters percent, and at 24 hours, it's one and a half percent. So we're, we think it could accomplish what we need, right, as a targeted radiotherapy agent. So we were really pleased with that. So finally, we did an EMT6 therapy study. Uh, EMT6, I think, is a, um, uh, a breast cancer uh, a, a tumor line that, when injected into mice, will create lung mets. So that's what we went with. Now, I, this is not targeted radioligand therapy because we're sticking with MAB201B, which just gets it close. It hits the thrombomodulin in the lung, okay? Um, but this is a model that Steve Kennel has used for years, and so we went with it. Uh, so I call it a proximity model, okay? So uh, three groups of mice, uh, one PBS, uh, one the, the nanoparticles uh, labeled with MAB201B, and one the nanoparticles labeled where we first gave um, uh, antibody, uh, again, kind of as a blocking study. So then the mice were sacrificed uh, after a week, and then the lung tissue was fixed for uh, uh, electron microscopy, and then the tumor colonies in the lung were stained and counted by a blinded observer. And so the colonies per tissue section are shown there, and I'm going to argue to you that we had a therapeutic effect, right? That we went from, in the control group of uh, 78 colonies per tissue section, to uh, 21 colonies per t tissue section with one treatment. Uh, so it was statistically significant difference. Um, the nanoparticles with competition, um, we're not quite sure why th that dropped uh, as it did. So some of the nanoparticles clearly got into the, uh, in into the lungs, and maybe that we're just seeing that effect. So I hope I've convinced you that this is a promising approach to delivering a, an isotope that, uh, you know, I showed you the prostate cancer patient, you know, just phenomenal results using alpha therapy. Um, the nanoparticles are retaining the daughters, the granddaughter, the great-granddaughter, so we don't think you're going to get a, a, a redistribution that you have to worry about. Uh, using the clodronate liposome significantly increased our uptake in the tissue we want to target, which is the lung tissue. Um, and then finally, uh, we, we saw a significant therapeutic effect in a proximity lung tumor model. So what would I like to do next? Okay. What I would really love to do next is establish lung mets in mice that there is an antibody that we can use to target those lung mets. And so I'm pleased to tell you that with the uh, creation of the Molecular Imaging and Theranostic Center on our campus, we were able to uh, convince Dr. Barry Edwards to move his research program from uh, the University of Pittsburgh to MU. And Barry is an expert in targeting and biochemistry, uh, uh, and its applications have been in nuclear medicine imaging and nuclear medicine therapeutics. So 
Barry and I have talked, and I've convinced his lab to start working on this because this is way beyond me. I'm, I'm a nuclear chemist. And so Barry plans this summer to create this lung MET model uh, you, uh, with human osteosarcoma cells and then target it with one 14G2A antibody. Our first set of experiments, again, will do the lutetium particles so we can follow them with our SPECT, um, small animal SPECT PET CT, which got installed two weeks ago in the new facility. So we've been waiting on that. And the vivarium has just gotten finished, so if any of the folks listening, uh, any of the faculty here would like to get involved in this area of research, we, we now have a, a um, research center set up to do all of the small animal studies. Uh, the center also has a small animal MRI, so you can do the MRI as well uh, as the uh, SPECT PET CT. And Dr. Carolyn Anderson, who runs that center, would be delighted to speak with any of the faculty here. So we'll first start with biodistribution of uh, lutetium nanoparticles. And if those SPECT images look good, then we'll set up a therapy study uh, using actinium. Um, actinium at the moment is quite expensive and um, hard to get. But um, so that's why we're going to start with the lutetium. So, and with that, oh. OK. Thank you. So. I'm happy to take any questions. Maybe make this bigger so we can see if anybody has questions. Are they going to unmute? I've not seen anything in the chat or okay. Yeah, no, they can unmute if yeah. they want to ask. Okay. okay. Dr. Monahan Nichols? Yes, yeah, Paula. Oh. Oh. Yes, Paula. Uh, yes, hey, good afternoon. Um, a, a very impressive talk. I certainly learned a lot. I'm not an, an oncologist, but the data was very impressive. I had a, a couple of questions. Um, so sort of three different questions. The first is, um, I see you use a lot of mouse models and there are some cancers that mice don't get. So do you use, you know, different types of models before you go to human studies? Do you use non-human primates? Um, that's the first question. My second question was, I'm a neuroscientist, and I was wondering uh, how effective uh, radiotherapy is for brain cancers, for example, or for uh, diffuse cancers. I mean, most of the cancers you talked about were solid organ cancers, for example, like liposarcoma or um, one of the hematological cancers. OK. So uh, the, an the answer to your, your first question. So we start with, typically we start with, with the mouse model. Um, uh, you know, there are some cases where we begin with rabbits. Um, but we have, uh, we're privileged that we have the vet school for the University of Missouri on our campus. And they have a very active group in radiation oncology. And so when, when the University of Missouri developed Therospheres, that, that was done in uh, companion animal dog models. Um, and uh, when Dow Chemical worked with the university to develop Quadramet, the um, bone cancer pain palliator, um, that was done in dogs uh, in the vet school as well before it went into humans. And the end result of that was while I can't give, well, I'm told we cannot give enough activity to cure bone cancer with Quadramet, uh, uh, it turns out that you can give a, a dog enough activity to cure their bone cancer. And people all over the country fly their dogs to the University of Missouri, Columbia to get that treatment because dogs uh, get bone cancer spontaneously. So did I answer your question on the animal? We don't do any primate work at the University of Missouri. Did I answer your yes. question there? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and, and, and Paula, you know, we... With the Next Gen Precision Health Institute, so um, that institute is set up so that in the basement you could image either uh, humans with a seven Tesla MRI or a state of the art uh, PET CT. But it's also set up so that uh, uh, at the University of Missouri we have the only NIH swine model uh, facility in the United States. And the faculty there uh, excel in creating uh, swine models for different disease states. 
So I, I would encourage you to, to you know, reach out to them if that can be of assistance to you in your research program. Uh, now, your second question was, uh, okay, um, so other types of cancer. So, so radiotherapy is used to treat glioblastoma in children. Uh, it, it uses uh, iodine-131. I believe the drug is MIBG. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't know how effective that is. Uh, the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, if you want to look it up, that's where that's done a lot. Um, and I know that because there was a worldwide shortage of iodine-131, and they were reaching out to us so that those children could get their treatments. Uh, and yes, um, uh, Scott Wilbur at the University of Washington in Seattle uh, and, and the Fred Hutchison Institute uh, are developing uh, alpha therapies for treating uh, the blood cancers. And um, Scott tells me the results are fantastic, although I don't know that they've published them yet. Um, but again, the idea that, you know, you've got a circulating neoplasm, um, the alpha particle is perfect for that. And in that case, they're using the radioisotope astatine 211. I don't know what they're targeting with. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. So I'm familiar with this in the area of the anti-CD20. So rituxan is the, the normal uh, Genentech uh, unlabeled version. Bexar is an I-131 version of it. And then uh, Zevlin mm -hmm. is the yttrium-90. Zevlin, as I recall, that one is an alpha emitter, right? No. no? no. So, so uh, Zevlin is a beta, but they're both beta emitters. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, the yttrium-90 is a little higher energy than the iodine-131 beta. Right. And... Uh, if, if, if I can express a little of opinion, right? So those were two drugs that worked. Yeah. They just didn't work way better than chemotherapy. So they weren't adopted by the oncology community. So big pharma sort of viewed those as not a success. Um, and so it wasn't until Zofigo, the radium chloride for bone cancer, and Ludothera came along where those two were viewed as, you know, really providing benefit that you don't get with traditional chemotherapy. And so that's now why pharma has taken notice and is investing in developing new agents. But that's Dave Robertson's opinion. Well, I, I remember because, uh, you know, the yttrium was one that you had to produce right on site. As you mentioned, it had a very short half-life, so you have to actually produce it there to then put it into the people, or at least a short time. It, so, it's, it's fairly short. I think if I remember right, yttrium's half-life is about two days. So you don't have to make it on site, but it expires quickly. Yeah, and I think they didn't have other partners. Yeah. Um, but I remember the, the clinical docs there said that they thought that as a first line was actually as good or better than rituxan and all that chemo. That, that, but basically people were afraid of using radioisotopes or it was just more of a, a different kind of hassle for them than, you know, whether it worked. It just wasn't, it wasn't way better. Yeah, but I think they were arguing for it as a first line rather than waiting. Like you say, if you wait for the late cases, then it's hard to recover. Yeah. You don't get numbers. Yeah, so I think, I think you're going to see that with the therospheres and the liver cancer. Um, I think the data are going to support that it's really effective for first line. And then, um, well, of course, the, um, uh, the Pluvicto, the PSMA 617 with the lutetium, um, we ha we'll have to wait for the data, but I suspect it's going to show some, some really nice results. So. Oh, that's the yes. uh, Peter. Peter. He, he, he can turn himself. Go ahead, Peter. Um, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Uh, this is Peter Kulin from Department of Ophthalmology. Um, I'm a neuroscientist just like Paula, but uh, we... Uh, have uh, strong collaborations with, with our um, oncologists in the department. And as, as you're probably well aware, a, a lot of the uh, treatment for the, the most common cancers in, in the ophthalmology field, um, such as choroidal melanoma or uveal melanoma, are typically plaque radiotherapy. And one of the problems that uh, many patients and their physicians are facing is that um, the, these plaque radiotherapy approaches, for example, using ruthenium uh, 106, 
uh, that, that you have tremendous side effects uh, on the, the nervous system, specifically the retina, uh, long-term damage, uh, and, and in many cases also uh, damage to connective tissue. Uh, do, do you and your uh, group or in, in, in Colombia in, in general have uh, folks that work on uh, strategies to, to shield unaffected tissue from uh, radiotherapy side effects. Uh, we, we have uh, quite a lot of engineers who are interested in that, but it's, it's a very small space to maneuver uh, the more traditional approaches that, that other uh, radiotherapy clinicians use. So I'm, I'm not aware of any on, on our campus. I will tell you that um, uh, there's a company that we're providing isotopes for that is developing, uh, I want to describe it as a little disc that gets inserted. Um, and that's as much as I know. I know it goes into the eye and, and I, I, I think it's, uh, well, I don't remember uh, what, what it's being used to treat for. So we're supporting that. Um, but what I would say is what you're describing with radioligand therapy is, we, is the collateral damage. And so how do you, how do you design uh, chemically, right, uh, nuclear physics, how do you minimize the collateral damage? So one would be to use an alpha emitter because it's only going to travel 10 cell diameters. So if you can get it where you want it to go, right? It's going to have a lot less collateral damage. Um, or use a softer beta emitter. A lower energy beta emitter would end up giving you less collateral damage. Um, so, you know, th that, that's, th those are the questions I would start asking. Um, so, in, and in your experience, um, I, I mean, I know the usual timelines for drug development, but... Uh, <laughs> do, do you have any uh, recommendations how one could um, use existing precedents from other areas of oncology to accelerate that process, or is it always starting from scratch? Because I know that I will get that question from our clinicians when, when, I, when I say, hey, this is something to look into, and then if the answer is 10 years, then uh, they, they uh, just furrow their brows and quickly leave the room. Yeah. yeah, so I guess the question is, what's the end objective? If the end objective is to get to the point where you can be doing phase zero, phase one, phase two trials and helping patients, right? Well, that's a two-year turnaround. Because hmm. um, we'll start in a small animal, mouse, rabbit, right? Um, uh, depending upon the results, the FDA may want to see a larger animal before you would go to first in person. Um, but, uh, but now if you're talking about getting approval through a phase three clinical trial, it, I don't know of any way to shortcut it. It's 10 years. And, and you know, you need a Novartis to says they're going to put $2 billion into it because it's an expensive yep. process. Yep. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the questions. So for those of you interested in, in, in neurological um, disorders, I, I will highlight that um, Dr. Tally Altez at the University of Missouri um, Hospital, uh, she's chair of radiology and nuclear medicine. Um, with the Precision Health Institute opening, they've hired a number of new faculty uh, who are doing research um, uh, for neurological uh, uh, disorders, both with the 7T MRI and, and developing hopefully new PET imaging agents. And, and I would encourage you to, to look and see what those folks are doing and see if you want to connect with them. Um, the, they're, they're, they're not physicians, they're fundamental researchers, so they, they, I know they would welcome being able to work with clinician researchers. Uh, maybe I'll ask another question. If you know, okay. um, so those very impressive PET results where you, you showed the, the uh, radiotherapy really diminishing the metastases. Do you, 
Do you or has anybody talked about trying to combine that maybe as first line and then following up with the standard uh, immunotherapies that are so effective now? Sometimes they get the same pet re reaction or, or responses that that showed. So in other words, maybe a lower first dose with the radiochemical to debulk or to hit most of the Mets and then clean that up with the, the immune system? Is that uh, a paradigm that people have thought about? Yeah, so um, people who are uh, the large groups in the country who are doing the radio ligand therapy, right? I, the, yes, they, they're talking about and doing work on combined therapies. I, I don't know how it's going. Um, uh, I'm sure the Society of Nuclear Medicine is in two weeks in Vancouver. I suspect there'll be a lot of talks on that. So yes, people are thinking that way. Um, I have my own combined therapy. So I'd like to mix in my nanoparticle both alpha emitter and beta emitters because the alpha is going to take care of the micromet. And now if I've got beta emitters that are there too, that I can get more penetration in, uh, you know, then I, I would like to see if there's a synergistic effect there. And people are doing that now with the PSMA 617. Only about 60% of men who get Pluvicto get a PSA decline from the four treatments with uh, Pluvicto. And we, we don't get quite, there's lots of going on in the literature. What about the other 40%? Right. But those individuals who didn't respond to the lutetium agent, they respond very well when you give them the actinium. So that's, I know that's not the combined therapy you were thinking of, but uh, that, that's what we're looking at. So. Dr. Robertson, you have a question in the chat. <clears throat> okay, let me, uh, let me see if I can go back to that and in the chat. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Any other questions? So I, I would, at the end, I would say to all of you who took the time to uh, hear a little about this today, if you would like to come and see uh, the operating reactor and see the facilities that we have for making these active pharmaceutical ingredients in your sister campus, I would welcome you to reach out to me. We would be more than happy to provide you with a tour. Thank okay, you thank, so thank you very much. <laughs> David, for a talk. Thank you. Very good time. Yeah, are, 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 are you an oncologist? Or? No, I'm a neuroscientist. You're a neuroscientist. Uh,